as we move ahead here, we've got, as all of you know, there's a lot of federal support coming to the city through the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, we have uh, additional money through our federal programming in addition to the money the city itself is getting, uh, our department is getting um, uh, additional funds. So there's a lot of planning that needs to take place. And so as such, we are going through a process among the program management staff here in, in hand about how we look at uh, each piece of our organization and our functions in the department, which are pretty broad, uh, as many of you know, and you'll go through and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll highlight some of those. But one of the things we're taking a look at is, is our efforts on sustainability. Um, the process we're going through, um, one of the things that we want to do is more regularly measure our success. So instead of, uh, you know, just updating folks once a year or periodically, we want to have a set of metrics that we're measuring success on in the department. And that looks like a, a lot of different things with respect to inspections that we do in our rental inspection program, how we're engaging our neighborhoods on historic preservation, uh, how we're engaging our neighborhoods through our uh, more narrow uh, neighborhood services program, but also how are, we, how are we doing our part on sustainability? And so um, I my first uh, substantive slide here is um, about that effort. And uh, I did it at the beginning here, so maybe you can think through as I go through the rest of the presentation, some ideas you have on how uh, the different functions of our department uh, can measure uh, our sustainability efforts. Here are some things we're talking about doing and that we have done. Um, so we do neighborhood cleanups uh, two a year. And so this last year, the two that we did in 2021 uh, saved nearly seven tons of trash and other waste from landfill and removed it from the neighborhood, uh, sent it to uh, recycling through uh, you know, hazard, hazmat uh, chemicals, uh, tires, metals, um, if you've ever been to one of our neighborhood cleanups, it's a huge effort where we, uh, there are places to put all your stuff. The people from the neighborhood just come out and bring whatever they want, and we find a place for it. And we also wood chip, when they clear brush, we, we have a wood chipper and a truck, and so that wood chipper uh, uh, does its, its job, and uh, uh, the neighbors uh, in our last cleanup spread wood chips in a path that needed to be uh, landscaped. And so try to reuse all that material the best we can or we, we dispose of it safely for the neighborhood. So uh, we have given four invasive species grants. So um, neighbors uh, up in Blue Ridge, for instance, had a, a good time with honeysuckle. And uh, <laughs> they, the amount of honeysuckle they got rid of uh, was gigantic. We actually had to help them a little more on that. But we are starting an invasive uh, grant uh, program. It's gone well. We're working with, um, I believe it's called IRIS, which is an organization uh, that deals with invasive species. And so we've been working with them. And uh, uh, today we actually talked about doing uh, mapping efforts. So where are we tackling invasives around the city and how can we sort of track that better? And, uh, and it's one of the things we're looking at doing. Historic preservation. Uh, now and again, we get um, requests for solar panels to go on historic homes. And so the HPC's action on that, I think, is, is uh, important. So we work with the SDE and we want to work with them more on how we sort of quantify that and look at, at what else we can do when we're adaptively reusing or making a historic property uh, more adaptable to the future. I think that's really important because you, you save the history as well as, as uh, making things more energy efficient. Uh, we have a pickup litter control program, so bags around the city. Um, people can grab those and just kind of pick up litter on their own. And then our, our rental inspection program, I would say um, both is a big issue of equity, but also I think when we have a, a full program, we are one of three cities in the state that has a rental inspection program. Out of 122 cities in the state of Indiana, only three have a rental inspection program, West Lafayette, Goshen, and Bloomington. And so when you look at what that does for the provision of safe housing, you know, you're looking at electrical, you're looking at, uh, at climate control, you're looking at windows, all those things, you know, it, uh, there's a standard uh, that those have to be uh, meeting, um, not necessarily uh, a sustainable standard, but if you think about the drop off there, if you have an unsafe environment, uh, I do think there is a measurable uh, effort there when you're looking at rental inspection program and holding housing stock to a standard that that should count. Uh, and we've got six staff that go out uh, and do our code enforcement through, through Title 16. It is a life safety issue if you don't have operable windows in your house. Uh, it is a life safety issue if your smoke detector isn't working or if your uh, outlets aren't right in the right room. So things like that, I think there is, there is a sustainability 
component in there. If you have other ideas, uh, my email, I'll make sure you have that at the end. I, I'd like any other input you have as you learn more about ham. If you've got ways, hey, have you thought about measuring this? We're happy to hear it because we really do want to make this part of our metrics. Going back to sort of the general functions of the department, um, obviously the issue of affordable housing is a big one. And uh, this uh, administration since 2016 has uh, created a, with created and approved, so that which has gone through the planning process and under construction or completed or approved um, as about 4,600 units of housing. Uh, on the affordable side, it's, it's a subset of that, uh, about 1,132 units of affordable housing in the city, which uh, uh, gets us to about 1,700 uh, bedrooms uh, in the city since 2016. So we focus both long-term on multifamily and single family, uh, which I'll talk about both the challenges for rental and home ownership uh, in there as well. Uh, and we sort of do this with a great sense of urgency. Since I came on, um, you know, I sort of came into this and there is a, a very fast moving uh, effort here, even though sometimes it doesn't seem fast because of, there's a process to things. Uh, there is a great sense of urgency with understanding that this is a problem, no matter where you go, it's discussed. I was at a, a economic outlook today uh, that the Chamber of Commerce and uh, Wilmington Rotary Club put on and housing was a big topic there. So uh, it, is, it is something that we are on top of uh, addressing here at the city. Um, so we look at these guiding questions, right? Uh, the mayor talks about this. I talk about this. How are we assisting people who are at risk of housing insecurity? Uh, you may know about the Heading Home Initiative and the uh, affordable or the Housing Insecurity Working Group. Not going to talk too much about that tonight because that effort is being really coordinated through. It's starting to move toward the uh, the United Way and the Community Foundation uh, here in Bloomington, and the city is contributing rescue plan dollars uh, through the appropriation by the city council. Um, to help that initiative. And so that, that effort is starting to take off their hiring staff and starting to establish that organizationally. Number two, what are we doing to keep residents uh, in their homes if they want to remain in them? And what are we doing to increase the production of rental and owner-occupied homes in the city? I'm going to run out of time here if I'm not, uh, I don't speed up. But we do have a lot of challenges with, with rental housing. About 60 to 65% of, of rental house, or 65% of households in Bloomington are rentals. And 60% of those rental households are cost burdened, which means they spend more than 30% of their um, monthly income on housing. Uh, and so that puts us as the most cost burdened uh, uh, metro area in the state. Obviously, uh, the student population has an impact there, but uh, when you look at it, um, several of those homes, a pretty high percentage is severely cost burdened, which means you spend more than 50% of your, of your income on, that, on housing. Um, and then when you look at evictions, we're uh, about three uh, per 100 households, uh, which is lower uh, than surrounding counties, but it's still fairly average uh, when you look at us uh, in the broader region. Um, and there's an eviction diversion program that's been created by the state Supreme Court that has just been rolled out, and um, the numbers aren't too great from that right now. So we are statewide. So we're looking at um, always what we can be doing to provide rental assistance. I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, also, the impacts of Senate Enrolled Act 148, this is a law that was passed by the General Assembly this last year that impacts and regulates the landlord-tenant relationship. So there are certain things we can't really do anymore in that rental inspection program uh, where it creeps into us regulating in the General Assembly's mind too much of that landlord-tenant relationship. So if you, if you know, if you've been a renter in Bloomington and you've, you've been given the rights and responsibilities document by our department, uh, that can no longer be done. Um, it's no longer a requirement. Um, and so certain things are, are uh, getting in the way of what we feel uh, helps people uh, maintain uh, safe housing here in Bloomington. So just a quick slide. This is from Prosperity Indiana on, on stabilizing renters. So going back to that, that eviction number and what it, what, how people are cost burdened, you just see a quick um, uh, breakdown of uh, Indiana versus Monroe County. I'm going to move ahead so that I don't run out of time, but I'm happy to sh share these slides with you all, uh, Jared, if that's helpful. Um, so what are we doing about it? What are the solutions uh, for uh, increasing uh, awareness of rental assistance? The state, through the federal government, through that federal funding, has a huge, very robust rental assistance program. And so the department uh, and the city are doing public outreach. We're looking at where we have computer labs available where people can go in and apply for assistance if they don't have access to the internet or a computer. We sent a uh, mailer out to property owners about another issue. And in, in that, uh, 
This went to about 2,100 property owners and agents around the city. Uh, we put information in there about rental assistance. We're working with the Apartment Association and the Bloomington Board of Realtors to talk about rental assistance. So the numbers as of yesterday, if you're curious, so what does this mean? Uh, households assisted in the in Monroe County are 565 and uh, totaling about two and a half million dollars of rental assistance that uh, has been distributed thus far. Now that can be, people are eligible for 12 months of rental assistance, either rear, rear, uh, rear facing or forward facing. And they're also available for, or eligible for utility assistance. Um, and when I say eligible, there are certain income guidelines you have to meet and there's a ceiling on, on the amount of money that you can get per month, uh, but it is there, the money is there. It's about getting the word out and making sure people are eligible. So we, at the very last slide, we'll be asking for your help to get the word out if you know somebody is struggling with rent. Um, I talked about the rental assistance or the rental inspection program and sort of solutions and equity. And I do, I do believe this is an issue of equity when you look at the number of inspections we do. Uh, uh, thus far this year, we are, um, uh, we've inspected um, thousands of units. Um, across the city. And when you look at the number of violations, this isn't a statistic to give you to uh, point fingers at property owners or agents, but you know, when you look at smoke detectors, when you look at life safety issues, there've been more than 2,300 of those identified thus far this year when you run an inspection report. All the, the violations we get, it could be uh, you know, um, something that isn't quite right uh, with a door frame or, or uh, you know, something hasn't been replaced. When you look at life safety issues, we're looking at, you know, if a smoke detector isn't there, if a GFI aisle, it's not in the kitchen, that kind of stuff that could that can endanger someone's life. It really speaks to, I think, the value of, of this program. Uh, we have uh, fair housing practices here at the city that we that we engage in, and then the Bloomington Housing Authority. Um, if you're interested in kind of what the, what public housing, uh, you know, through the housing authority is doing, they're in the middle of a seventy million dollar renovation for all three hundred twelve of their units. So if you know. Are three different um, properties that are run by the Bloomington Housing Authority. That's a lot of affordable housing, and it's important to know that that investment is taking place. And they're basically looking at what does it take to make a unit new, right? Is it kitchen cabinets? Is it new appliances? Is it new paint and carpeting? What do they do? They're just renovating each of those units in different ways with an average uh, investment. Uh, the investment range is sixty-two thousand to one hundred about one hundred twelve thousand dollars per unit. Uh, which is a really important uh, and sort of uh, transformational project that the housing authority is engaged in right now. Uh, we have a housing development fund here at the city. This is this is money that comes in. Uh, developers make contributions. We have loans that we make out of it. We get payments there. Um, and just to give you an idea of what that fund does and what it has done, we've spent uh, upwards of $900,000 out of that over the last four years for about 10 projects around the city, 10 housing projects. So Union at Crescent is one. Um, we've done some stuff with Bloomington Cooperative Living, Switchyard Apartments, uh, the eight units there. Um, and this just shows what, uh, what we have in there, what's expected, uh, and what we have to give out. Um, and so we look, we're always looking for opportunities to invest in affordable housing projects uh, that we think will, will do well from this fund. And, and uh, we have some outstanding commitments, Habitat for Humanity, we are helping fund infrastructure at their new Osage Place neighborhood uh, down on the southwest side. And then we are helping out with that housing authority renovation as well. Real quickly on home ownership, um, let me get to my... Um, as we move into home ownership and rental, the, the, the hospital site um, project, uh, ESD is involved in this. This is a sort of a city team effort on uh, the redevelopment of the hospital site. So uh, when that comes into the ownership of the city of Bloomington, by the end of 2023, our goal is to have things uh, moved along. The, the site will look much different over the 24 acres. Will be the, you know, they are going to demolish the hospital. Um, and so we are uh, looking at housing goals their affordable housing goals, along with sustainability goals that Lauren has probably updated you on or knows about. Uh, and so when we look at the affordability model over there, we're looking at what we can do and what will make sense financially over that, that huge site. Uh, it's a real opportunity for us. Um, ownership. Um, just, I think you all know that the challenges associated with rental housing, home ownership is even kind of harder to move the needle on because you're looking at what can we do for, to establish one unit of home ownership versus maybe building a multifamily complex of, of housing. Um, I just ran a quick search a couple of weeks ago on, on 
the, the, the MLS here in Bloomington and looking at the number of houses. The issue is finding an affordable a house that's in an affordable range here in Bloomington that, uh, that a, a professional or a single person or someone moving into Bloomington uh, for a new job can afford. And that's a real challenge to find a house that's afford the median that you can afford. The median sales price of a house is at least $250,000. I saw numbers today that had it closer to 260. And so when you look at that price and what you can afford, uh, if you're in that workforce housing income, which is 80% of area median income to 120%, or if you're 80% or below. When I was a young professional looking at my first house to buy my first house, I was right at that 80%, maybe a little over, and I had trouble. And I, there was a certain range. I was down below, one, way below 150 on what I thought I could afford. And if you, that was 15 years ago. And so you look at today, there's nine, there were nine houses available under $150,000 for sale in the city of Bloomington, right? In those confines and the corporate limits. I put all the elementary schools in a search and just said, okay, these are thereabouts what should be the city limits. And nine properties came up under $150,000. So what are we doing about that? We have a lot of funding through our, our programs here at the city and those that come into hand. We've got community development block grant dollars, home investment partnership funds. We have the housing development fund, which has a, a down payment closing cost program for people that are income qualified. We also have what's called a shared appreciation home ownership program, which gives people uh, incentives uh, up to $50,000 to help with down payment and closing costs and gets immediate equity into a house. And then there's a long-term affordability there that we, that we put in. We're looking at a development of a community land trust uh, in partnership with uh, Summit Hill Community Development Corporation, which is the nonprofit development arm of the Bloomington Housing Authority. So we are um, looking at, uh, well, uh, rescue plan dollars have been appropriated for that uh, both in 2021 and 2022. And then of course our, our uh, unified development ordinance um, had uh, uh, changes in it that allow for more diverse and dense housing stock in the city. So numbers, I've shown you those numbers at the, at the outset. And we've got some goals, the Bloomington Housing Study that we commissioned last year has us uh, bringing in about 2,600 more units of housing, uh, affordable and market rate uh, over uh, the next nine years. Um, and so that is a goal. Um, and obviously with the things we're seeing in the economy, those are fluid or uh, supply chain issues. Uh, costs are going way up for housing. We're getting numbers uh, on infrastructure and things like that that are pretty high above what our projections were. So we've got to keep all that in mind as we look at these goals, but having goals is important. And so we get there by looking at the housing study, by looking at other uh, documents like the comprehensive plan, um, keeping our eye on that economic data as it gets updated, working with partners locally, regionally in the community, uh, and then looking at how we can use those uh, financial programs and the UDO and all those other tools to, to, to uh, get that job done. So. Um, there you go. I'm a fast talker and I think I spoke quickly. Uh, but uh, last thing, I will leave this slide up as long as I can keep them shared. But the rental assistance link, if you know somebody that's struggling with rental assistance, indianahousingnow.org is where they should go. You can go right on there and you can apply for rental assistance that way. Um, and uh, it's an important tool. Uh, and the money is there right? for the first time in a long time. We're not out there. Well, we're, how are we going to pay for this? It's the money is there. You just have to get people to it if they're eligible. People do get declined, they do get turned down, but uh, a lot of people have been helped. So would encourage you to help get the word out there. So happy to take questions, Jared. I've probably gone over my 10 minutes, but wanted to make sure I gave you guys a good, good breadth of what we do in the department. There you go. I'll stop sharing so we can see each other. Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. If people have questions, yeah, I think it would just be easiest if you use the raise hand feature and John, you can call on people as you see. Sure, I see uh, Nasla up first. Hello, and thank you for that wonderful presentation and thank you for coming to visit our commission tonight. Um, so I, um, I'm really, I'm really happy to see all the um, work and success being done by um, HAND and Mayor's uh, Affordable Housing Team and BHA. Um, and I, um, I want to emphasize, because I noticed in your presentation, 
that you seem to equate sustainability mostly with environmental sustainability, which is awesome because that's like clearly an important part of sustainability. But I wanted to emphasize that our commission is tasked with, um, with, he with helping Bloomington to become sustainable in many ways, including um, economically and in social equity. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to ask, um, I noticed that it seems like there's a lot of a lot of very appropriate work being done in the affordable housing area because based on the research that we've done for the housing first resolution, um, that uh, the lack of affordable housing is the number one systemic cause that gets people to be unhoused in the first place. Mm -hmm. However, we have a second and related issue of homelessness, which um, due, to, due to the lack of these affordable housing policies and actions in the past, we have a homelessness problem in our community that needs to be addressed. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you could speak more to your work in that area and of um, and of uh, addressing the concerns in our Housing First resolution, particularly around um, the, um, pe the pe people who are currently unhoused. Um, because I'm, I, I think, I'm guessing you'll agree with me, but based on my research, I think a lot of people who are unhoused um, may, may not simply qualify, may not, may not have that situation solved by simply having access to affordable housing. Sure. Um, let me start, um, and I don't have a resolution. I, I just pulled it up. Um, sorry, I should have that pulled up ahead of time. But well, I think uh, first, first your point about not just being environmental sustainability focused is important. Um, and I think that's a really good note. I just pulled out my file on our metrics and added that as a note because I you know, my, one of my internships in college in 1998 was at the President's Council on Sustainable Development, which was a Clinton, a Clinton administration body that he formed, and it's now it, it went away when he did. But the, uh, you know, there was more than just environmental uh, sustainability in there. It's just a really good point. So thank you, and we will sort of look at how we can measure sustainability in other ways. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up, Angela. Um, I think the work that Han does on helping those who are unhoused. Uh, you know, we work with Community and Family Resources, which is really the lead, a, the lead department in city government, uh, working with our shelter directors in town. But what I will say is we do um, ongoing programming to help uh, those who are unhoused in the, in the community through uh, the Community Development Block Grant uh, program, for instance, that helps bolster our safety net through um, youth services, through daycare, through rental assistance, um, through um, food assistance. So we are helping vulnerable populations. Um, it's an ongoing problem. We also, you know, uh, looking at our housing first projects in town, uh, Crawford and, and Kinzer Flats, we've provided a, a lot of dollars for those and those are ongoing um, uh, projects that we work with both agencies, Life Designs and, and Centerstone on those. So there's a lot that HAND does um, and the issue of assisting those who are unhoused, I think is, you know, that housing and security working group is going to sort of lead the effort. It's a, it's a pretty systemic problem. And so we're looking at how, how to address it that way. And so the housing and security working group through implementing the heading home plan is really going to take a, a lead on that, but the city is a huge partner there where I sort of ran through it quickly in my presentation, but we're appropriating uh, $1.2 million for 2021 for that group uh, with more to come in 22. And so um, you know, when, when the city is able to provide funding and others are able to help implement, that's helpful. Uh, but the city is still going to be uh, maintaining our commitment to help them bolster, bolster, bolster excuse me, that, that social service network through community development block grant dollars, for instance. So there's a lot we do there uh, as well. And uh, did I answer all your questions? Uh, let, me, let me look at the resolution to see if there's anything I left out there. I'm happy to keep answering, but... Uh, those are the two oh, main things. Um, well, I guess just to just to clarify, I guess, uh, to, or to restate, I guess, what is what is Hans' plan in order to um, in order to 
uh, permanently eliminate homelessness in our community. I, I, I'm, a, I'm familiar with the housing and security working group and the heading home report and plan. I actually noticed they don't seem to have a plan to eliminate homelessness. And I was wondering um, if, that, if that is a part of HAND's priorities. Is that one of your goals? Well, I think it would be. It's it's probably all of our goal, right? I think you'd, you'd asked this question on a previous uh, council meeting, I think, Nigel, and I think I answered because I, I think it was specifically related to housing first and whether I think the figure was a million dollars or something would that eliminate uh, the need? And no, it won't. And there, this is not a, I think it's everybody's goal to, elim to eliminate homelessness, but can I tell you that we're going to do that by a certain point? No, I won't. I think it's uh, irresponsible for me to tell you that because I don't think it's, I just don't think uh, that's, it's a goal, but how do we, you know, I, I think it takes a lot of folks. I think we are doing things to help uh, reduce it, um, but it's not just, you know, uh, what HAND can do. It's it's how do we work with our other agencies? It's a, it's a huge effort uh, for all of city government and others in the community. So I I, uh, yeah, I think it's a goal, but uh, I don't want to overstate that, right? I mean, I think we, it is our goal to uh, create housing opportunities, affordable housing opportunities for people here in the city. Um, it's our goal to make sure kids have uh, daycare, uh, both for their early childhood education and so their parents have uh, safe and affordable daycare so that they can work uh, if, that's, if that's what they choose to do. Um, so I think we're tackling the problem in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it takes more than just hand to eliminate homelessness, but I think we, it is our goal to uh, reduce poverty and increase housing and housing security in the community. So hope that's a, that's a decent answer for you. I just, you know, eliminating homelessness, I think is a, is a tall order and something I, I don't think anyone wants someone who is unhoused but it takes a lot to get there. And I don't think it ends the problem. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it can be a cyclical problem. So how do we reduce that? So how do we help that cycle? Uh, you know, and do we, do we say, well, by this year, there's never, there's not gonna be any more homelessness in, in, in Bloomington, but you know, uh, uh, what are other communities doing? I think it takes more than just Bloomington, quite frankly. So I think it's a, it's a big problem and a big task. but I think we are doing a lot to help it, help with the issue, with the problem, both monetarily and programmatically. Anything else? I think Colin has his hand up. Oh, oh. can't find, oh, Colin, there you are. Sorry about that, I didn't see your hand. No worries, thanks, John, for updating us tonight. I'm wondering, to what extent does your department have a hand in uh, up in implementing or helping to implement the climate action plan for the city? Well, I think it's it's what I I talked about. I think we can be doing more. I think we, you know, Lauren uh, convenes the climate action team uh, periodically here with the city. And I think it's our job to sort of look at what we're doing, um, how we can do it better, right? What, how, can we, how can we do our part? That's what I think everybody should do. What are we doing to do our part as a department? Are we the, the lead on this, that, or the other? Uh, possibly, but I'll be honest that it's sort of introductory right now. We are, I'm very interested in a uh, sustained effort on how we, how we can measure how we do our part, right? So we're not just talking about it and saying, yeah, we do, we believe in sustainability in all aspects, but I can't tell you how or what we're doing about it. I think it's really important to state it. So I've got, I'm looking at my notes here where I've got Trash Safe and Landfill, I'll pick it up program and bases. I talked to you all about safe and affordable housing. I wrote down initial, uh, you know, notes about economy, uh, that equity, that, that sort of stuff. I think we've got to sort of quantify it, right? Uh, and that's not something the department has done thus far that I know of in a, in a, uh, a concerted way, but we're trying and we're, we will be doing that as part of uh, our other efforts in the department, so. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm wondering. So, are are you, is your department required to to help implement the climate action plan? I guess I'm I'm just curious, like if it's legally required to, to help out with that or not. Legally required? Well, I think the 
uh, Council Member Flaherty, <laughs> ask for some direction on what we're no, no is the I, answer. I mean, <laughs> plans are, are plans. Uh. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a little new to the city, so I don't want to uh, misspeak there. But I look, I think it's it's our job, right? We're we're a city department. We have a climate action plan. I think we should we should contribute. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, and I'll just clarify, Colin, your, your point. There's a difference when something comes in front of council between accepting it as part of city code or ordinance and strategic documents. So um, the reason that council accepted the climate action plan as a strategic document is because we, first of all, it's our first one. So looking to see what's effective and having the potential to change and pivot depending on what's working and what isn't working. That's why I'm working internally with other city departments to figure out how can we continuously improve and move forward and look to each department's respective strengths and working with hand and, and hand staff on things like historic preservation and meeting and talking about what's the role of climate action within the residential sector um, and how can we be most effective in outreach and communication with neighborhood associations too um, and rental properties in terms of what their responsibility is as well because I think there's a role for the city and there's also just a role in utilizing existing networks and getting the word out to foster collaboration and communication so there's there's some existing efforts happening on this but I think as with any department we're looking to um, better measure impact as well, because even if we have ex existing activity happening, it's better to communicate exactly what the results were from that. I mean, seven tons of waste from the neighborhood pickups is actually a, a pretty large amount, and we can look to see how that has increased over time as well. We're really trying to align. I mean, so the mayor's, you know, the mayor's, uh, to the mayor's big priority is just sustainability and equity. And how do we, how does hand contribute to both of those, right? And so I, so I talk about the, the rental inspection program is, in my opinion, a matter of equity. I mean, it's one of the few in the state. Um, and, you know, why do we have seven staff dedicated to the enforcement of code, uh, Bloomington Municipal Code Title 16? I mean, what does that mean to a, a lay person? You know, well, here's a program we do, here's, Here's how it provides safe housing. It's not just code enforcement. It's not just enforcing a law. It's making you know an effort toward sustainable uh, or safe housing, I should say. And I think that's really important. Uh, with and we have you know with the twenty five thousand two hundred rental units in the city, that's a lot of housing. And I think uh, we have a role to play there, and and it should be talked about. Uh, and I'll also say because some in the general assembly don't agree with that, and I think we need to defend it and fight for it because I think it does make a big difference. So for whatever that's worth. Uh, so that was that it, Colin? Did you have another question? That was perfect. Thank you. Okay. And Nasal and I that Joe or Joseph, I don't know. Uh, don't want to call you the wrong thing there. Yeah, Joseph is good. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you as well for taking the time to give the presentation. And I'm mean, glad to hear about both your and the department's interest in being proactive and intentional about engaging in, in sustainability and measuring its um, uh, impacts and progress on it. And also that I think HAND has a lot of potential there because sustainability really comes down to the individual and community level changes. And I think that HAND is perhaps the department that's best suited for reaching and interacting directly with individuals and communities. And um, I was glad to see the list that you have, and I do have some more thoughts and suggestions, and I appreciate you extending your email as well, and I will put those to you following the meeting. So thank you again for everything. No problem. That, I put my email in the chat, everybody, so if you have something you want to throw out, please do. So, uh, Nasal, do you have another question? Oh, yes. Um, I do have one more question. Um, give, given that the Housing First resolution um, declared housing as a human right, Mm -hmm. And um, given that um, forcing people who may be disabled or elderly or be marginalized in, in other ways, forcing anyone to sleep outdoors is a violation of several uh, international treaties on uh, civil and political rights and the treaties against torture. Um, given all of this, do you, um, do 
do you agree, for instance, that it is it is the responsibility of this city to ensure that adequate housing is provided to um, to people, for example, that we identify gaps that exist in the permanent supportive housing in our city? Um, do you think it is it is the responsibility of the city to have someone whose job it is to identify those gaps and ensure people are housed and that our city is fulfilling its obligations under these treaties? And if so, whose responsibility is it? Is it hands? Is it BHAs? Is it the United Way? Please um, specify. Thank you. Well, I think it's all of us. I think that is there one person identified to fulfill the role that you're talking about? Um, no, because I think there are several people doing it and filling their roles and fulfilling their role in different ways. I think when you look at the international, you know, the Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, when you look at, uh, I, I, I want to talk through this a little bit because I think you had asked this question at, on a council meeting as well. That, that made me think about it as how do you, you know, should, how do we look at housing as a right? Do we look at it from a um, sort of theoretical level or a practical level where, what does it mean? If you, if you look at city code, does, does what the, the 1947 or 48 Declaration of Human Rights, if I've got those correct and I've seen some fact sheets and everything else, with all that information in there, if you put that on top of city code, what does it do? Right. It's our job to implement and enforce city code to uh, put in place policies that we feel are going to improve the quality of life of people in Bloomington. So I don't think it's as, um, I don't want to say simple because it's not a simple issue, but I don't think it's as clean as do we believe it's a human right uh, and how do we implement that right locally without taking into consideration all that's in between. So in, first and foremost, the, the local law, which is my responsibility. I'm duty bound to follow that. Identifying gaps in permanent supportive housing is I think a role that we in hand uh, do. I think we look at areas gap, every grant cycle we have is an, every application that comes through is a, uh, it, it is an identification of a gap where services are needed and are not otherwise being provided or are not being provided in a sustained way, right? So um, we do a lot to fill those gaps. Um, doesn't mean everyone has adequate housing, no. I think we all know the answer to that. It is not, it is not uh, ensuring that goal 100%. Do we put forth the effort and do we put significant investment from the city both in manpower and finances? Yes, absolutely, both in Crawford, you're talking about supportive housing, and in, in Kinzer Flats, our, our commitment to Crawford, both one and two, is significant, both in dollars. Our, ins our inspection staff is down there uh, frequently. Our emergency services uh, are down there frequently. We work heavily with the two agencies that are the leads there. So um, I think it's a really complicated um, answer to your question, but I'm pretty confident that we are, we are doing a lot of work. Are we doing everything we can? No. Uh, I don't know when I can say, yes, we are doing everything we can. I don't think it's a pride. I, I'm not comfortable. I think I, this is what I said last time. I'm not comfortable telling you when I think we have done enough or we've done everything we can. I don't think it's a problem. I don't think that's a, that's not a responsible answer for you uh, because it's never done. There's always going to be somebody needing a service that will help them be more secure who is at risk. It's just, a, it is a, I think, a fact of life that we would all like to see people have an improved quality of life, but um, I've been in this business for 25 years and all over the state and in the country, and there's always, always someone in need, and how do we fill that need? And I, um, I think we look at everything from housing as a human right to how we're looking at it broadly from community development. It's, is it just housing? No. Is it daycare? Is it job security? Is it Housing security, yes, it's all those things. And I think the city does quite a bit to uh, fill those gaps. And that's a pretty long answer for you. <laughs> so okay, I, I, just there's, there's so much I could tell you. Like I just I'm trying to 
right. sort of make sure I'm answering your question, but also making you aware of what kind of what we do and how we approach the problem, right? So it's a very complicated issue, as you well know. Yeah, for that detail, oh. I just had yeah. one follow-up question mm -hmm. um, since, as you were mentioning that, you know, you consider your primary job is to enforce our local code. Um, no, not my primary job. I, I am I am bound by law to do that. Primarily, yes, I have to do it, but that's not, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't consider the enforcement of the law my primary and my and the motivation behind what I do here. It is my job to do it and we do that and we there's a lot more we do and can do and should do. So I want to be clear about I don't I don't come in here every day just to do code enforcement. So and so and so related to that. Um, do you view the 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 city's um, in the the city's inaction on you know making sure all of our residents are housed might possibly be violating city codes on um, not cleaning up trash that's left behind by people who are forced to live unhoused in our community and who particularly tend to congregate near sensitive environmental areas such as. Creekside, um, is the city possibly violating its own codes? Thank you. On health and sanitation. Yeah, well, look, I I can tell you, look, I, I won't you know, remember the city council on in robust discussions earlier this year on, on this very issue on what we allow and what we don't allow. And I'm not going to claim to be an expert there. What I can tell you is we approach, um, I think we approach it uh, in a, in a humane way where we have to live, we have to balance. This is a, this government is a balance, right? We get negative feedback on both sides, right? If you're allowing someone to be in an encampment uh, and you don't believe they should be there, there's negative feedback there. If there's resulting, you know, if there's debris left behind, trash, whatever, what have you, um, there's, there's negativity associated with that too. So I think we have to do our best to balance. And I think that it's a very, people in on the city council, people in the mayor's office and this entire administration take it extremely seriously um, and how we balance the needs of those who are unhoused and those who are uh, otherwise business owners, residents here in the city. So um, I'm not gonna say whether we violate our own code. I, I'm not you know, I'm not an attorney, I'm not the legal department. It's not up to me to necessarily decide that we violate our own code. I know what our code enforcement is in hand, uh, which is Title VI, which is neighborhood compliance, which is trash and weeds and things like that. And we do focus largely on residents. And what is what is the Title VI enforcement issue at residents, at, at residences around the city? And so, um, you know, if we're, we are, addressing that issue at an encampment or something like that. It's not just a hand function. That's a, that's a multi-department issue. If there's a, if we are addressing an, an encampment, um, that is a multi-department. It's public works, it's community family resources, it's social services, it's all of us. So it's not a singular, you know, hey, I'm not going to go to one of my inspectors and say, hey, go, go tell the unhoused folks at that encampment they need to clean up their trash. That's, that's not how we approach that problem. It's, it's, it's more holistic than that. Sorry to interrupt, but we got to uh, keep moving on the agenda. Yep. Um, thank you so much again for coming and presenting to us and taking questions. Um, sure. Anytime. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you want to email me the your slides, I'm happy to um, send them out to the group as well. I'll do that. Thank you. If you have any other follow-up questions, just shoot me an email. Uh, like I said, it's in the chat. So appreciate the time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So next on our agenda is the report from council. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jarrett. <clears throat> um, just a quick note on the on the housing homelessness um, uh, issue. Uh, you know, I think there's some strong differences of policy views among council members, among folks in the administration on, on some various things, and that's that's all fine. Uh, part of the po political process. Um, I'll just I'll just say like on a, on a process level, uh, I am of the opinion that kind of regardless of where we land, that that those things do need to be public and codified, and and that's not some so that it's you know transparent um, and part of the public discourse, kind of regardless of where one falls on the policy spectrum there, and that's not something we've been able to 
uh, achieve yet. So <clears throat> I see that as part of a kind of social sustainability uh, uh, goal we should have. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. I've, I've had conversations with, with some, of you all, some of you all about this issue in the past. I'd be happy to talk more. Um, and on that front, I always, uh, by the way, have um, monthly constituent meetings on the third Mondays of the month. So I think that's coming up uh, next Monday uh, at 530. And there's Zoom details for those on um, the city council calendar. So I'm always happy to go in depth on, on things we don't always have um, time to go into more here. I um, uh, wanted to echo the points Lauren made about the, the um, uh, climate action plan uh, as, an, as an advisory document, as opposed to like the comprehensive or transportation plans, which are statutorily required. Uh, by the state and and have uh, legal implications with regard to um, development decisions and that sort of thing, uh, whereas the cap is is uh, more of a planning document. Um, that said, I, I think it's you know we should take it very seriously and, <laughs> and do our best to implement it. Um, to that end, on the council end, um, uh, we've recently uh, joined and become um, involved with the uh, internal climate working group uh, that Lauren convenes on a bi monthly basis uh, with primarily department heads, um, but some other folks too. Um, and I think the so I'm the council um, representative on that on that body now, um, as of a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we are going to have more frequent meetings with the Climate Action and Resilience Committee of the council um, with um, Lauren and her team uh, to to just be in regular communication about the climate action plan. Um, and I see my role in that working group as uh, what I what I mentioned this meeting just the other week was um, at least preliminarily developing a a, a work plan to look at a roughly seven and a half year uh, implementation timeframe for all the legislative items that are contained in the climate action plan. Um, and I'm not sure like what other departments uh, organizational efforts look like, like, um, you know, uh, John Zodi was just talking to us about, you know, his department and their role and Colin was asking questions about that. So that's something I'd be curious to learn more about in time. And I uh, think we should be thinking about. Um, and again, to echo uh, some of the points Lauren made and agree, um, you know, this is a, it's a combination of, of city operations, uh, city code things, but lots of community-wide actions too, right? That uh, this commission, I think, can and should be involved in um, with, with regard to outreach, with regard to ensuring programmatic success, because we need to do a lot of, um, imp implement a lot of things on a sort of community scale um, that, are, that are part of that climate action plan. So um, I think there's hopefully gonna be important ways to plug in on that too, um, for this group and uh, for the folks working on it. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, I guess, two other things. One is is um, uh, a group called Confront the Climate Crisis, which is a group of uh, high school uh, youth uh, who had been in touch with this summer, um, uh, sort of a self-organized group that has made some real progress on uh, a variety of things, including getting some communities to pass um, climate emergency resolutions or declarations, um, as well as working uh, with some state uh, representatives to uh, bring, I think, a, a couple of items of legislation um, to the, uh, the session that's coming up at the beginning of 2022. Um, and, and I had spoken with these folks this, a bit this summer about uh, the possibility of a city council resolution with regard to um, recognizing the climate crisis we're, we're living in uh, and uh, thinking about you know, what we could do with the resolution in that regard. I think it's important to state those, those things. There was this sort of trend a couple of years ago around climate emergency declaration that kind of waned during the um, uh, uh, early days of the pandemic, uh, but I, th I still think it's worth acknowledging that formally. I think it would be a way for us to, to firm up our commitments on the council level um, of net zero uh, emissions goal for the community by 2050, which was first introduced as part of the climate action plan, uh, supporting other initiatives like some of the uh, legislative things at the state level that I think are coming out, um, as well as maybe calling on some other partners to, to help us uh, meet our ambitions, um, notably, for instance, Duke Energy. Uh, you know, we can't uh, achieve our goals um, as a community without them accelerating uh, renewable energy um, deployment in their in their Indiana footprint uh, more rapidly than they've committed to to date. Uh, so you know, doing some things like that as part of a resolution might be um, a possibility. I would I would welcome anybody on the commission who'd like to uh, collaborate on that uh, to to reach out and let me know. Um, ideally, I'd like to bring it to the commission um, for its its input and and approval uh, if we can figure out the timing. I did mention there might be a little bit of time sensitivity uh, early in the next year with wanting to get it um, through during the, uh, during, like while the, the General Assembly at the State House is in, in session. Um, so something to think about, but I wanted to flag that and invite people to, to um, reach out if they're interested in that. And then finally, um, just with regard to um, 
another update since since we last met. Uh, of course, we passed a, um, a city budget ultimately a few weeks ago, um, and there were some, I think, I think challenging but like important conversations around uh, different policy views uh, with regard to any number of areas. Um, you know, from from policing to um, uh, I guess uh, transportation initiatives to sustainability and um, you know I think principled policy disagreements among uh, some council members and the mayor on on all of those fronts. But I think we wound up in a place where there was meeting in the middle on some things um, and, I, and just a couple of highlights uh, I think that came out of that. Um, one is a commitment on the mayor's end to um, bring some general obligation bond um, proposals early in 2022 uh, that will target uh, sustainable transportation infrastructure. Um, and, and capital investments there to help implement, for instance, the transportation plan and or address um, accessibility issues where we have some challenges. Um, so that's one investment that I think is important. And then also looking at, um, I think, some increased staff capacity to, to help um, on the programmatic side with the implementation of the climate plan, uh, which is really quite quite lofty and, and involved um, at, and you know in depth. So um, I think those are promising developments uh, and I, I'll stop there with, with updates. And but like I said, I'm happy to follow up on those um, uh, after the meeting uh, with folks or or in an upcoming uh, constituent meeting on Monday or any other time. So thanks. Thanks, Awesome. Happy to answer questions too. Sorry if you have them. If we have time, I know we're tight on the agenda. Colin, did you have a question, or was that your hand still raised from earlier? Uh, it's a new hand. I had a comment. Actually, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so well, I have to run, folks, but I did just email my um my personal update on the the Raya proposal project to Jarrett. So hopefully, Jarrett, you can um, read that on my behalf. But I did want to mention that there are some issues with the concept of net zero that I would love to discuss with this commission um, at uh, soon or sometime because I think it's they're significant. So. But anyway, I've got to run. Thank you, uh, Matt, for your update. Thanks for that, Colin. Majla? Oh, this is a question for Matt Flaherty. Are you working at the Environmental Resilience Institute? Yeah, I recently started um, with the ERI, I guess almost two months ago now, uh, which is hard to believe. Okay. Um, but if, if any of y'all knew Andrea Webster, um, uh, I, I've stepped in the role that she used to occupy. It's the, uh, the title is implementation manager. It's a lot of the um, uh, local government assistance, uh, capacity building, technical assistance, uh, program management kind of kind of things. So, yeah, Sorry. it's been great so far. But kind of a whirlwind. I just heard it, and I wanted to confirm and share it with any other commissioners who may be interested. Is that an IU department, or is it a private? It's. It's it's associated with IU, yes. It's a um, okay. it's it was part of the Grand Challenge um, initiatives around that university's bicentennial. So they were it was called Prepared for Environmental Change, and it came with a lot of uh, research mm -hmm. dollars that were handed out and faculty hires and things like that. And we're sort of transitioning out of that five year funding window and tra transitioning more to a grant funded philanthropy philanthropy funded um, uh, institute where where the outlook it, uh, some things will evolve and change, but the outlook on the um, uh, government and nonprofit and business partner program side and student development, uh, career development pieces are all, um, the outlook there is all looking really good. Okay, well, thanks and congratulations. And I'm happy that we have even more connections with um, with IU and with the community. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and thanks, Angela. Any other questions for Matt? All right. Well, thank you for your report. We will now move into old business. So the uh, first thing on the agenda for old business is the Environmental Justice Solutions 2022 event. Um, we, some of us attended a meeting with uh, Mary Bell and Colin, not Colin Murphy, that's on the commission, another Colin. And uh, that was, I believe, last week, last last Tuesday, actually, I think a week ago today. And as Lauren said earlier, I think it went really well. Um, before anything else, I'm gonna read Colin's notes from that since he had to jump off. Uh, so he said, 
Uh, we likely need more funding to make the most of our time with EJS. They met with us pro bono last Tuesday, and currently we have funding for only one hour's worth of preparation and one hour of presentation time total. I think we'll need two hours of presentation time if possible. Thus, I think extra funding to the tune of one hour's worth of rate for each Maribel and Colin is warranted. Uh, the next phase is to set the date and time for our meeting with EJS, then begin reaching out to community partners. Uh, Colin generated a list of other boards and commissions at the city and county levels that he thinks we should reach out to, possibly to partner, but certainly to participate in the event. And that the next Just Transitions Working Group meeting is on November 23rd at 7 p.m. Um, so, and that was kind of something that we talked about uh, with Mary Bell and Colin was uh, whether we thought we the the time that we had allotted in our original resolution was worth or was was enough uh, for what we were hoping to accomplish. Um, and I think that's something that we can definitely talk about. And uh, alongside the obviously setting the date and time for the event itself. So if anybody wants to contribute, I know a few of you were at the meeting as well. If you have any comments or anything, Lauren, yeah. I just wanted to follow up that um, I will work with them on the actual logistics of getting their service agreement facilitated. And um, I think for the December meeting, I can work with whichever working group is appropriate to come back for an amendment of an additional amount of time and funds required. So we just went through the budget reforecasting process as a department. So I'm in a better position to state what our financial resources were than the first time we talked to them. So even though they've offered a discount rate, I don't think that will be necessary, but I'd like to work with a subset of you to be better um, codify what that additional time will go towards. Um, I felt comfortable with the initial resolution, but we should be more specific in terms of what the additional time will support in terms of outcomes. And I will work with all of you in the next couple of months to make that happen, as well as the boring administration, administrative pieces like W-9 forms and stuff. Awesome, thanks. And Shelby? Yeah, Lauren answered this just a little bit there at the end, um, but could you, did they more um, accurately kind of define the structure of what that presentation portion would include versus what that um, workshop portion would include? And then um, I know, Lauren, you said that as we added more time, it's like, what what additional goals will we gain? Um, but kind of sitting where we're at, did they kind of go over what that would look like more specifically, or are we still kind of in the dark about that? Um, I can kind of touch on that. And if, Lauren, if you want to jump in too. Um, they, uh, a lot of our meeting with them last week was them kind of explaining the process that they went through with uh, the Rea in Oakland. And um, so I think we, those of us that attended that meeting learned a lot about their process and kind of how we can uh, implement some of the things that worked well for them uh, in Bloomington. So uh, one of the things that I know we talked about was uh, ensuring that meeting places where we're trying to meet with members of the community are uh, not places like city hall but are like community places like uh, the public library they suggested um I'm trying to think of other things that were suggested in that um but yeah i think that we we learned a lot more about their process and definitely want them to share that um as part of their presentation and then help us uh Go through a process i know alicia i think asked them for like a step-by-step -step guide kind of to what they their process so that we have that physically available to us and can kind of uh make edits uh that make it more a, a good a better fit for bloomington um and and yeah they were very i think receptive to the idea of spending half like spending part of the time on a presentation and part of the time workshopping with us kind of you know, doing the hands-on, hands-on type stuff. Yeah, I'll just add, they have a lot of experience facilitating community conversation, which is valuable um, in terms of making sure that we continue engagement on aligning the climate action plan goals with what different aspects of the community are concerned about. So I can see 
an aspect just speaking to their experience um, working in that community, but also working um, with us to facilitate a broader community conversation. And then the second half of that workshop would rely on ensuring that we're meeting as a commission, um, perhaps with council to talk about what are some tangible next steps while looking at our actual plan in equity implementation. So that's where I think before coming um, in front of the commission again in December with any sort of amendment, that's where some work needs to be done um, between me, the commissioners, and the potential consultants about what an extension of that contract would look like. Shelby, did you have a follow-up question or comment? It's just a small one. Um, just to clarify, the additional hours that we would be adding on would be succinct. They wouldn't be an additional separate session. They would all be together, correct? Right yeah, I think... Event. Yeah, I think the idea, it wasn't to create a separate session per se, but just to ensure that we have enough time to accomplish all that we want to accomplish and that we're compensating Mary Bell and Colin fairly uh, for the time that they're um, out, like that they're they're working with us. Because um, I know like last, last week's meeting, as Colin said in his notes that I read, they did entirely for free. So just to ensure that we're not taking up too much of their you know, they're doing a lot of prep, I guess, for this presentation that we're not kind of exploiting uh, their labor. Lauren? Oh, I'm not trying to my hand up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to lower it. Yeah, Nolan? Yeah, this might be irrelevant if they didn't offer it up front, but sometimes those, <clears throat> excuse me, consulting groups, might know of other grants that are available for their services. So it might be worth asking if we're looking for extra hours, if they know where money might be found for that. Yeah, definitely. We can include that in, in our next email with them. Does anybody else have any comments, questions? Oh, just on that point, I would add, I found their presentation extremely useful. And um, I, I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation with them and in, in, um, in following up. I, I, I really uh, salute Colin for all his work and leadership on this and everyone else in the um, working group for pulling, the, for pulling this together. I really learned a lot and I'm looking forward to working with them. Awesome. Well, if no one else has anything that they would like to contribute or ask, um, we will move on uh, before we leave old business. Does anybody else have any old business that they would like to bring up at this meeting? Already seeing none, we will move into uh, new business and there's nothing on the agenda for new business. So if anybody has any new business that they would like to bring up, uh, please raise your hand. I'll, oh, Joseph, yep. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Jarrett. I did actually have a question that was mostly with respect to the report from um, ESD. And it's related to the city council update that was provided on October 20 in the, um, there was a 2021 uh, sustainability progress report. And I had wanted to ask, well, first of all, to, to complement the extensive list of color coded goals that was included at the end of the document in the appendix, which was comprehensive and magnificent. And I just wanted to ask if there is an intent or um, a capacity to track the status of goals uh, dynamically over time to have either um, current as the current state or steps taken or next steps planned just to have an idea of where the goals stand as we move through time. Yeah, thanks for your question. So um, yes, so basically over time we've been looking to increase the functionality of, of these progress reports. So um, between this one and the next one, we have a web-based platform called Socrata that I've been working in to try to create more web-based visualizations in terms of 
what we're doing specifically, what is the city doing in regards to different goals to give concrete examples and, and ways for the public to be able to better visualize what that looks like in terms of a city service. So um, keep tuned on that. I think that one thing that's important is to also, while talking about what progress we've made to anticipate what's coming up next. So um, the way that we currently communicate in regards to what's planned is not very accessible to the public. So you could pour through our budget documents and get an idea of that, but that's not how most people grasp information. So we're breaking it out by subject area. Um, and so it's a work in progress. I think there will be, it will be something that we're adding to over time and continuing to improve um, by better connecting existing programs, initiatives to what the climate goal is and looking at showing other ideas of things that are happening in the community is something that I think we're working to communicate. Um, so yes, um, it may end up being like a skinny version of that that we add to over time because um, as we increase the functionality of our web platform, that gives us more opportunities to do data visualization. So I've been meeting with a couple of <clears throat> different consultants that are working with other communities that have more integrated platforms, but I think it's it's sort of a balance between, um, I would prefer that the money goes towards um, actual programs. And so creating some way to com communicate effectively with the public without creating a reoccurring expense um, in terms of uh, public funds is also kind of a balance there. So working on it um, also, would like to keep the commission um, apprised of that as well because sometimes it's helpful to get you know many set of eyes on something to ensure that we're communicating in a way that um, is clear to the general public and so i think keep an eye on that uh, moving forward keep that as probably a recurring agenda item as well um i'll just jump in just real quick because you're talking about that um i i do this for my day job we do a lot of data visualization and website uh, design and everything. So if you ever need feedback, I'm happy to help. Thanks. I appreciate that. I'm certainly not the expert on that. So it's been a learning process. Thank you for the information, Lauren. I appreciate that. Already any other new business that anyone has? I just did want to say we're, we're running a little low on time. Something that's important for me moving forward is if your working group is planning to meet in the next, before the end of the year, especially to let me know so that we can get those on the city calendar, that we can communicate them as a commission between not only now and December, but if you can kind of talk internally about what your expected meeting frequency is for next year, then we can anticipate that. We did have some members of the public that came to the last working group meeting, which was great. Um, they were interested in the agenda topics. So even if it seems like you're only meeting with each other. This is a great opportunity um, for the public to drop by if they're interested and learn about what the commission's doing. And then the second thing that I did want to mention, so if someone from your group could email it to me or be in contact, um, we can get those scheduled. And then the second thing was some people's terms are um, set to expire in January. That does not mean necessarily that your time on the commission has to end. So I will be emailing out um, the application, that's just a structural thing that indicates to me that you're interested in continuing, and then it will go in front of either counselor or the mayor to decide whether to continue that appointment. So those are two things that I'll be following up with you all um, on in the next couple of weeks so that we can end the year um, and know whether people intend to continue to serve. Awesome. Thank you for that, Lauren. Um, then we will move from new business to working group updates. Um, other than the message that Colin included at the end of his email to me about the next meeting being on November 23rd at 7 p.m., are there any other updates from the Just Transition Working Group? Already seeing none, we will move to uh, the updates from Waste Reduction Working Group. 
I will just note that we have yet to convene, so there is no information to convey at this point. Awesome. Thank you, Joseph. And policy working group. Hi. Yes, our working group met in October and um, we discussed the um, housing first resolution and particularly um, that we, our commission should consider or the working group anyway would um, recommend that our commission should consider a, a passing a version two, uh, either in December or January uh, to um, sort of update the city with, um, with that topic in relation to our commission's goals. And, uh, and, and I'm currently working on that. And Ms. Bazzotti's visit here today was very helpful towards that effort. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That's the only update for me. Awesome. Thank you, Najla. So uh, that brings us to the end of the agenda. Does anybody have anything else that they wish to bring up before we adjourn? Okay, seeing no hands, uh, we will adjourn this meeting. Uh, our next meeting will be on Tuesday, December 14th at 6 p.m. Um, and we will, we're still waiting to hear whether that will be online or in person. Is that correct? Uh, you know, it's looking, I, I don't know, we'll just have to see what the governor does, but <laughs> uh, I think we're all moving towards the hope that we can be in person, but I'll let you know. <laughs>